went from being an atheist who was desperate to figure things out to more or less who I am today from a spiritual perspective of believing in the things that I believe about the interconnectivity, believing in the presence of spirit, God, whatever word we want to use for div the divine, all essentially in one weekend. Welcome to the multiverse, where we believe that mushrooms can actually save the world. Each week, we'll be meeting with thought leaders and experts to extract the best insights and stories across everything from functional fungi, psychedelic medicine, and so much more. Thanks for listening. Step into the multiverse with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Into the Multiverse. This conversation has been a long time coming, I feel. <laughs> and behind the scenes, a little insight into what's just gone down as we sat down. We're a little delayed getting this started. And... Adam Roa is sitting with me on my couch and he looked over and said, am I ready? And smiled at me and he had a cacao nib in every single tooth because he just consumed a, a matcha mint smoothie. So we went to the, you know, he went to the bathroom, lost his teeth. Uh -huh. um, and we were just talking about the chaos of returning to life from Burning Man, which I want to talk about in a second. But by way of introduction, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, a few, there's a few things I think I could, you know, there, you do a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually at a bit of a loss of like how to describe you. But mm -hmm. um, in short, I would say, you know, high level, you're an artist, a spoken word poet. Um, you have a huge social media presence. You put a lot of content. You are a media as medicine, as some of our friends like to say, creator in the world. Mm -hmm. And you have beautiful poetry, which I've gotten to hear some of live for the first time in recent weeks. And I'd love to start with you sharing one of those, whichever one you feel called to. I know we discussed a few, but I think it'll just give people a really good idea of who you are and, and what you're about. All right. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me in into the multiverse and um, also for getting a chance to sit down with you. We haven't actually had this before one-on-one -on -one drop in. So I'm excited for that. And I also struggle to identify as any labels of what I do or who I am. So giving my art, I believe that art is the purest expression of our soul. It, it is the um, expression of our soul's frequency. And so uh, I'm excited to share my art right now mm. and, and let people just kind of feel me rather than try and talk about it. So mm. I'm going to do a poem called Heaven. And this poem was created uh, from a deep inquiry into what is actually abundance. What does that mean to me? And and how do I live a life of abundance? And what can I do to spread a life of abundance? So mm. for everyone listening or watching right now, just please take a nice deep inhale. Exhale. The most impactful thing that you can do for the world is learn how to love life all of life. Show people that being happy doesn't mean turning a blind eye to the pain and the sadness and the suffering that happens here. Show them that choosing love doesn't mean ignoring fear. It just means being willing to feel. And those brave souls will always heal as long as they maintain the courage to feel. Because the fear of feeling is really at the root of every fear, which creates a fear of living because feeling's why we're here. So you can fight the fact that feelings past have felt so freaking hard, but it's the very fact that you have felt all that that feels like the part we should celebrate. Investigate, learn to navigate with ease. Your emotions are the gift God gives you every time you breathe. Energy in motion with the strength to bring a king down to his knees and yet contained within emotion is the key to set you free. Contained within emotion is the gift of what being human is, a chance to feel all of life from deep sorrow to deep bliss. And you might wish the two would split, but the twist is that they'll always coexist because even the heartbreak you hate today had the way paved by a lover's kiss. And so you can write your list of how life's a bitch, but don't forget the asterisk because for all the times you went through shit, it fertilized a lot of gifts. But if we only focus on what we lack, we can't appreciate what we've got. But with gratitude for what we have, we can see that it's a lot. 
And that is the difference between abundance and scarcity. It's not about what you have, it's about what you see. So the next time you forget how blessed you be, take a moment and focus on the next breath you breathe. The next time you forget how blessed you be, take a moment and focus on the next breath you breathe. And notice you're right here with me. A miracle, a great mystery out of hundreds of trillions of stars in hundreds of billions of galaxies. Somehow, some way, you're here today with me and we both breathe. On a spinning sphere of chemicals spiraling through the universe, you were once one of 200 million sperm. You just happened to get there first. So how could you ever think you're cursed? You've been blessed since before your birth and you might not think you have it best, but it could definitely be worse. And if you don't believe that yet, go tell the deaf what you just heard. And if you don't like what you see, go tell the blind how much it hurts. On your hardest day, when you really wanna walk away, go tell the paraplegic how it's unfair. Share how you wanna run from all your problems while he's pushed everywhere in a chair. And I'm not saying that life is fair or that it's easy. We all go through a lot. But as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, don't lose gratitude for the fact that you walk. Celebrate the fact that you can dance and sing. Embrace the abundance in the very act when you talk. Because when you can spot abundance in the simplest things, that's when more abundance unlocks. The simplest things. Taste, breath, touch, smell. Did you know there are people with something called anosmia, which means their sense of smell is completely lost. So while they literally can't smell the roses, do you want to complain you don't have the time to stop? Because this life is the only one that you've got, and there are people who would trade places with you without a second thought. So no matter how many tears, heartbreaks, or bad days you pay, the cemetery is full of souls that know living is worth the cost. Don't wait till it's too late to learn that lesson. Living is worth the cost. But make no mistake, being alive is not the same thing as living. Just like throwing something away is not the same thing as giving. So if you haven't yet found your love of life, I suggest you keep on digging and allow yourself to feel your way through all the hurt and all the rage. And as you feel, allow yourself to finally turn the page. That's how we heal, and it might hurt like hell, but you'll have shown us we'll be okay to feel it all and still love life. That's heaven, and you'll have helped pave the way. That's heaven. Can you feel it? Heaven is here today. Mm, so good i've <laughs> I've gotten to hear that <sighs> yeah let me just take a second and let that land <laughs> wow also you know just remarkable at your memory and articulation of mm-hmm. all of those words and you don't skip a beat every time it, it lands different every time but mm-hmm. um, i've got to hear that three times now live and uh, many directions we could take that <laughs> I, have, I have i have 25 questions written down for you and mm-hmm because of the unique human that you are, none of these questions kind of relate to each other at all. Yeah. Um, but what I, what I like do- Like your kind outfit. Of, <laughs> like my it's outfit. Perfect. It's perfect. It's, it's chaos. Like it's my, like my beautiful mind Beautiful right chaos. Thriving in the chaos. Um, mm-hmm. But what I would like to double click on that came up for me as you were speaking is in the community that, you know, focuses a lot on personal growth and spiritual expansion, um, it's so interesting to try to find the balance of not spiritually bypassing yourself in the sense of like, it's all love and everything is all wonderful. Um, let, you know, and letting yourself feel all the feelings of, you know, the full range of, of emotions. And I'm just curious of like how you, how, how in practicality do you find that balance? Because, you know, the question is, is really, sometimes we keep ourselves in toxic dynamics because we spiritually bypass ourselves into thinking that like my life is so great and there's all these beautiful things and like finding the silver lining Mm -hmm. where you should be paying attention to things that are maybe um negatives that will help shift you towards like a more aligned path and you know so much of the work 
is finding the positives and that you know I think your poem was so beautiful and like feeling all the full range of emotions mm-hmm. and realizing how beautiful your life is and I'm just curious like in practicality like how does that show up for you That's a really great question because it is a massive issue that I see in the quote unquote spiritual community, the woke community. I don't know what we call it. It just, to me, um, the community that wears malas and, and, (laughs) and uses (laughs) spiritual jargon. Um, one of the big things to recognize about this is that a lot of people who are drawn into spirituality are drawn into spirituality because the body is not a safe place to be. So that was mine. I experienced sexual abuse at a really young age and had PTSD in my system. It was a repressed memory. I didn't even know that I had it. And so my nervous system and my physical body and this life was not a safe space. And so um, what spirituality offered me and offers so many people is this idea that you're actually able to transcend the human experience. You're able to to find a community where you get rewarded for how far out you can go instead of how far in you can go. Mm. And when I, it it took me a while to realize that's what I was doing. It took me a a while to realize that I had suddenly started placing more value on the transcendence of my human than on being human. And what shifted for me is recognizing, do I really believe that I'm going back to the place I came from? It's metaphorically, I'm, I, or literally, I, I'm God, source, oneness. I will return there at some point on this journey. I came from there. I will return there. So that means that I chose to be human. Why the fuck would I try and spend my entire time transcending being human? Why would I avoid being human? Why would I be so strict about like not allowing myself to enjoy the senses food, pleasure, sex, like whatever it is, I had had gotten so strict into that devout spiritual ideology because I thought it meant that I could go further out. I get more access to the Arcturian information and the Akashic records and all of the things. And uh, (laughs) when I realized that that was a way of actually avoiding the discomfort of being human, uh, that was a big eye opener for me. And so I now look at it as can I ex- I can only expand I guess you can expand in, in a singular direction if you put all of your focus and intention there but for me this is why I'm here is to be human and so it all starts there and ultimately any spiritual experience that you have will happen through your human vessel so no matter how deep your ayahuasca ceremony or mushroom trip or whatever you're still experiencing that through the neurochemistry of your body And so there is no escaping being human while you're here. And if we're not paying attention to that as a foundational pillar of our experience here on earth, I think we're bypassing the entire point. Yeah, beautifully said. And, you know, I think um, one of the interesting things that I read, I'd like to read it actually, I read, I read online your description of what you do in the world. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, <laughs> it might be totally outdated. Who knows? No, let's see. And this is from your website. It's from, Got it. And, um, you know, because a lot of what you just said resonated with, you know, I think what a lot of your work is in the world, like trying to explain this concept to people and, and try to help them live their best life. And this is what um, you wrote on your website. I'd like to hear you put it into maybe like muggle words and, um, you know, translate it uh for people that may not really know what this means. But um, you say, I find that my real job lies within the willingness to dive into all the aspects of myself that might get in the way of being as pure a vessel as possible for high vibrational frequencies to pass through me into the world. So when people ask, what do you do? I tell them, this is such a great LinkedIn one-liner tagline. Um, I tell them I transmit frequency through conscious content that I create the workshops and performances I lead, the one-on-one group coaching programs that I facilitate. And I trust that by transmitting as pure a frequency as possible, I can get out of the way so that those that have the willingness to take a leap of faith will receive the transmissions and find themselves empowered as the infinite creators that they are. They may have just temporarily forgotten. So, you know, I, obviously this, for me, this, this feels, you know, I resonate because it's, 
do you think this is like actually what you do in the world? And it feels very embodied. How would you describe this? Like any thoughts on this? Yeah, I would reword that. You were in, it's funny it's because outdated. It's, yeah, it's if outdated. You're like, oh, my sister wrote all, that. All I did, of I this stuff. Well, it's funny because that that gives you an idea. This is perfect. I'm glad you read that. I didn't even know that was on the site. Um, <laughs> but the you can tell that I wrote that from a place where I was far more in the spiritual, like I can tell I was more out of body in mm. in the writing of that. It's still what I do, but just the way that it's worded, I can tell where I was coming from. Mm. Um, and I hear the opportunity for uh, integrating more of what I just even spoke to yeah. into that, which is great, so yeah. thank you. Uh, and yeah, I think that on a practical level, all our minds do all day long is pattern recognition. We are constantly putting together bits of data and we are making meaning of that data based on the patterns that we can see. And so when you, as an example, if you don't know a language, you could literally drive through a city and not know that it was language written all around you. They're just symbols or, or whatever. When we look at like hieroglyphs, that's a language in ancient Egypt that tells these stories. If you don't know how to read it, you might just think they're drawings, but they're actually language. They're communicating very specific things. And so um, there are these layers of reality that unlock for us when we're able to put together the patterns. And that it includes personal development where all of a sudden you're able to see why you behave a certain way because your brain got the data point from that ayahuasca journey or mushroom trip or coaching session or therapy session. And you go, wow, now I see. And it puts together all the patterns. And all of a sudden you are able to see it everywhere. And so we if you understand that your mind and the the really what your consciousness is, is is based on pattern recognition well then the question becomes how do you amplify your ability to recognize more patterns how do you consciously become involved in in analyzing and recognizing higher more complex patterns in your life mm -hmm. and the way that i believe that that happens is through uh, the law of attraction, the law of magnetism, like attracts like. And if I am in a state of physical being where my frequency, using that term, the frequency of my being is low, I will operate in a way where I'm only able to pattern recognize at that level. Mm -hmm. And a great example is anytime you've been exhausted and super tired, how well can you really like pattern recognize the depth of what's been going on in your relationship at that point in time or you go and eat a bunch of shitty food and party all night and drink and then like it, it, the next morning how well are you going to be able to put together the different things that you need to see in your business it's it's very rare that that's ever going to be the case however if you find yourself in an expansive state and this is where psychedelics are so helpful when you find yourself in that expansive state of love and compassion and you find yourself eating well and taking care of your body and there's vitality there's a whole physiology that happens that shifts your neurochemistry it shifts the ability for you to put together patterns and you'll see them at a more complex level and when you're able to do that you now unlock the entire the, an entire new layer of reality out there for because you have that one pattern and I think that based on what you read there, it's just an understanding that my what I see my role as is how do I continue to unlock a massive amount of pattern recognition that I can then synthesize down and try and put into the Trojan horse wrapping of poetry or mm -hmm. filmmaking or even be able to articulate concepts that other people may not know but feel deep down my ability to do that is going to be based off of how well i take care of my physical mental emotional and spiritual health and so i focus on that and then i i do my best to translate it hmm. how did you get here like what everything you just <laughs> described you know 
<laughs> there is a chance that you came out of the womb speaking like this. But like, <laughs> what can you just talk a little bit through, you know, I like to think in LinkedIn profiles. So if you just want to think like a few chapters of your journey that you want to like share starting, you know, maybe from when you were in high school, like mm-hmm. brief highlights. Um, obviously there's not, it would take the entire, tw- you know, take 12 episodes to go through the entire thing in, in detail, but uh, oh, Sarah just pressed, Sarah just, Sarah pressed, just pressed my phone. Like, boom. She's like, nope, done, done here. Done with those pressed questions. Pressed my phone for those that were, um, we have Sarah and who's Adam's dog. Serendipity, she's Serendipity. the best. Serendipity, she's chilling on the couch in between us right now for those that are listening. And yeah, can you just give us a few highlights, like close the gap? So let's see, close the gap. Um, one of the biggest things is I entered into high school and I, I weighed 73 pounds. I was five, I was slightly under five feet tall and I weighed 73 pounds. My oh. dad's from the Philippines and I looked way more Asian back then when I was younger too. Um, and so I basically was like, I'm fucked. I, I just, from a standpoint of, I'm going to be this tiny little Asian kid um, that doesn't get girls and is the class clown. I'm smart and whatever. I'm going to need to focus on non-physical aspects, essentially. And I'm going to have to become really successful and rich and, and all the things to get what I want out of life. And I had that mindset. because Which dad, at the time you thought was women? or I think women. every dude feels like they need to get women. I, I think that's a very, very common thing. I, I think that in many ways, especially when we're going through puberty, our self-worth and our idea of ourselves gets imprinted based on how the opposite sex perceives us. I think that's a very common thing to have happen. And so my dad was my dad is five five and my mom's five foot. And so I my mom says I got my height by sheer willpower, just refused to to, to accept that reality. But Point is, I went into high school with this kind of chip on my shoulder and went, okay, I'm going to win high school. Like, I'm going to just become, like, how do I win this whole game? And by the time I graduated high school, I was varsity in multiple sports, student body, this, elected to that. I schol- academic scholarship to college, president of, of clubs. And mm. uh, then I won homecoming king. And so winning homecoming king to me like that's the movies like varsity blues and everything say not only will all the girls at school want me but their hot moms will also want me and so Stacey's this is like mom. Yeah, exactly so like what stacy's mom was written about exactly oh, i gotta read the re- re-listen that song and see if there's any patterns absolutely I can right i i'm i get to be that dude now and i woke up the next morning and i felt no different I felt like I was still insecure. I was still had this unprocessed anger. I still had so much doubt about myself. And um, what was worse was that I didn't have something that I thought would change it. I didn't have this mountaintop idea of if I get there, this will be different because I was on that mountaintop at that time. And now, nature, nurture, I don't know what happened, but I'm very blessed to have then extrapolated that to what if everything else that they're telling me to do doesn't bring me happiness? What if mm. everything else, like go to college, have the career, get married, 2.5 kids, white picket fence and a labradoodle, what if that doesn't make me happy? Then I'm gonna be 40 years old and having this same experience. And so that opened up the questioning that opened up the self exploration. That's when I started to check out personal development books on my own. And um, because I was blessed to have parents that gave me certain books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Mm. Michael Jordan's biography. So like, I was used to the idea that you could read inspiring books, but I hadn't ever really gone that route on my own. And so that was one of the first major turning points coming back to high school of where I started questioning the path that I was on. And that led to me um, making a decision to move out to, to I went to college, uh, but I made a decision that I was going to move out to LA and pursue an acting career, which was the first thing that I could remember ever loving as a kid. And that decision to follow my heart, despite the fears and leaving behind my friends and family and where I grew up and the job offer and all of the stuff, that was a distinct turning point where I said, nothing will matter as much as following my heart from this point forward. And so, yeah, that was the first major turning point of how I got here. 
That's such helpful context. And um, I what, what came up for me is, as you share that, I have a lot of people in my life, I'm sure you do as well, many people do if you're listening to this, where um, the, they achieve a goal that they've set. And often for people, it's very career focused, right? Because that's where a lot of, you know, you go to, you, you follow the typical American path, right? You go high school, college, career, you're like in the rat race. And then maybe you achieve some sort of like career high, monetary high, you sell your business, you become on a, whatever it ends up being. And then you're like, oh shit, doesn't make me happy. I feel no different. They have that experience. You experienced that at age 18, 18 yeah. and they were able to course correct. If you had to pick I love to think about this. And I, it's one of my favorite <laughs> questions to ask people. And actually one of the best conversations like round table I've had, I've had this multiple times with different groups of people is like, what class would you teach in school mm-hmm. and why? And I'm curious, you know, what class you would teach in school and if it would be related to kind of that awareness and helping people realize that quicker, you know, that like this destination happiness thing doesn't exist. Mm. I think a lot of people are teaching that. I think a lot of people are teaching that. So I you think in in like high school and stuff? Uh, no, in, in high school, I I think that that information now it's interesting because you have celebrities that constantly say being rich and famous will not make you happy. We have evidence of celebrities all the time who are in rehab, who are killing themselves, who are right. struggling through divorces, who are clearly not happy and they all say the same thing. Like being rich and famous will not make you happy. It, it's it's not that thing. And everyone goes, oh yeah, sure. Sure, whatever you say, that's easy for you to say because you're rich and famous. <laughs> but who the fuck else would tell us that it wouldn't make you, like you need someone rich and famous to tell you that it won't make you happy. You don't have someone that un, like, some unknown homeless person on the street that's like being rich and famous is not going to make you happy. You need someone who's who's traversed that mountaintop. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't seem to matter how many people tell us that money will not buy you happiness or that fame will not buy you happiness and can often amplify and cause more problems. It doesn't seem to matter how many how much evidence of that we have. People still are living primarily through this idea that if they get somewhere there we go. Great soda. Sorry, great soda. Sorry brief, brief, <laughs> brief Budweiser Olipop. intermission for the Olipop grape soda burp that just happened. <laughs> we have to leave that in. <laughs> I, I had the cacao nibs in my teeth, and so I decided to swish my mouth with grape soda, and now it's- <laughs> The breakfast of champions. Olipop, by the way, not r- real soda. Just healthy. Uh, it's a healthy probiotic, slow sugar. Pro- probiotic, low sugar. initially. <laughs> and so- um, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to make it in, probably. Absolutely. And so- <laughs> And so we we have these these this evidence, and yet people are still living their life in pursuit of something they think will change their inner state. And I think people are kind of numb to that message. Like you need you, you need it to be experiential. Yeah, I think I think there is some level of people need to experience it to really believe it. And I don't know if that's true for everyone, but I'm just noticing. What I'm saying right now is not unique. This mm. is there, we have plenty of 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 this out there. Totally, and yet it's, it's pe- the core message of all self, you know, right. development. And so stuff. I wouldn't teach a course on it because I just don't think it's effective. I I would actually teach, um, mm. I would teach a course on how to utilize creativity for the processing of one's emotional experience. I started a a nonprofit. It's called Surrendered Artist. And what we primarily do is teach kids how to use art as a technology for processing whatever they go through in life. Mm. And so based on the fact that I started a nonprofit about it, I feel like that's what I would teach kids. Mm. (laughs) And um, is interesting to me because I had I alluded to this. I had sexual. I was sexually abused at the age of five, and it was a repressed memory that I did not remember until I was thirty years old. And the reason it was repressed was because my consciousness basically made it a d- decision and said, "This is too intense. You do not have the tools, the skill sets, the support to deal with this. So it it needs to be locked away until you you are ready for that." And I feel like had I had the understanding of how I could write poems about it 
or draw pictures about it or dance or sing about it or play an instrument or something with the actual, not just to do it, but to, with the understanding of how I could use it to move emotion and energy in my system. I don't know that that memory has to become repressed. And I don't know that I spend 25 years of my life building a life that is touched by darkness through every aspect of my life without even realizing it. Mm -hmm. And so it's very personal to me to help people understand that we have this tool that is creativity and art to, to heal. I, I think that's why it's here. I really do believe that your creative energy is the purest expression of your soul. It's the thing that makes you unique. If we asked everyone on earth to write a poem about love, we would get 8 billion different poems. If we asked everyone to draw an image of a, a mushroom, like we would get 8 billion different images. None would ever be the same. And so that tells me that your unique soul signature, your fingerprint of your soul is your creative expression, it's your creative energy. And so if that's the frequency of your soul, expressing it is allowing it to move through you. And when we understand how sound healing works and cymatics and, and just the impact of frequency on matter, what could be more healing of a frequency to move through your system than your own soul signature? I think this is a really good point to start talking about psychedelics. <laughs> and if, for, for maybe like a little bit of a different reason than, than you think, um, in part because one of my favorite things to do and one of the most therapeutic things that I've ever done is painting while on mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So the combination of those two, while you're, you know, neuroplastic via a, a psychedelic, like psilocybin, LSD, whatever it is. Um, and also what you would what you described when i was asking you the question around class like what class would you teach in school um and not wanting to teach this destination happiness type class because it needs to be experiential so the reason why psychedelics work is because they're experiential mm -hmm. and you actually go through this experience of you know dying before you die or ego death often or just you know processing of a trauma that you didn't realize was there and the most awakenings I've ever seen myself or anyone around me have is whether it's, it's, it's two different things. Either um, someone really close to them dies, they go through a psychedelic experience and and they die. You know, if they, feel, if they feel like they die, they experience an actual ego death or they physically feel like they die and they come back to life in that experience. Um, and then actually I'm going to add a third. I have uh, friends that have experienced this and it's it's wild. They actually flatline, you know, they've been in a crazy accident or, um, and they were pronounced, you know, which is a massive release of DMT in yeah. the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they were, you know, pronounced dead and then they were resuscitated and brought, brought back to life for various reasons. And so I'd love you to share your experience with psychedelics. It's stuff that we, you know, we've had brief conversations on, but when did they come into your world and how do they make their way into your, into your life? Wow. So we we could talk for hours about it. Psychedelics have, have been a major part of my life for uh, many, many years now. So, I mean, literally, Ali, from ayahuasca, San Pedro, peyote, aboga, ketamine, cocaine, heroin, like medicines. And, and, and I include, by the way, um, like heroin in there. I, I don't discriminate. There is a difference between psychedelics and other types of drugs, but like it, from an entheogen standpoint, um, lots of experience and they've shaped my life tremendously. I think that ayahuasca is one of the two greatest teachers I've ever had in my life. And I think that my first experience with psychedelics was mushrooms when I was 18 uh, years old and it was what led me to pursue an acting career because I was sitting there on the couch and I was tripping and I, they, there was like a <laughs> pillow that had all these little threads in it. And then there was one thread that was just like missing. Like there was one area, there's a thread missing. And I had this moment of going, none of the threads on this pillow, except the, the ones right around it, have any idea that that thread's missing. I said, this is like earth. It's like, I don't want to be, when I leave, I want the whole pillow to know. 
I don't want to be the thread that left and no one has any idea that that thread's gone except for maybe a few threads around. And I want the pillow to feel my absence when I'm gone. And that was where I started thinking bigger about my life and what I, how I could actually create the biggest impact. And the biggest thing I could see at that time was acting. So these people have the platform to do whatever they want. And I wanted more than even the acting itself at that time, I wanted the platform to be able to, to start nonprofits, to be able to like direct attention and move attention, uh, which is energy. And so that was my first psychedelic experience, which set me on a path. And then ultimately pursuing an acting career in LA was one was a massive, humbling, terrifying, difficult experience where life had come so easily to me. I'm a very smart individual, charismatic, all those things. And once I hit puberty, happened to turn out uh, to have some height and and um, some symmetry to my face. So mm -hmm. I've had opportunities that I feel very blessed to have, you know, really, really deeply grateful for the blessings that God has bestowed me with. And um, life came easily. I didn't have to study and I got straight A's. I, I didn't have to work very hard at athletics and I was athletic. Like there was these things, but acting humbled me because it wasn't working. And so I had to work really hard at it because I was so emotionally shut down that I had to logically learn how to feel. Legitimately, I used, I had to learn how to tap into sadness. I didn't even know how to cry because I'd shut down so early from an experience with my father. And so acting saved my life by reconnecting me to my emotions. And I wanted to give that gift to people because I was so shut down that the only time that I ever felt anything was when watching movies. And the only time that I allowed myself to cry was when I was acting. And not only that, suddenly I was being admired and celebrated for the more deeply I felt. And so it created this positive feedback loop of feeling emotions and being celebrated for mm. it. And <coughs> so um, I dove in and I gave it everything, but it didn't, it wasn't working. Like I wasn't sure I, I had a few spots on TV and, you know, Lifetime movie with Rob Lowe and like these different things, but it was always on to the next thing. I'm trying to get my career to this place. And there was rejection, rejection, rejection. And I went through one of the most challenge up until that point it had been the most challenging year of my life in 2012 and everything that I associated any sort of my value or my identity to was crumbling away from me from my career to my finances I literally had signed a, a, this contract with this terrible manager who literally was insulting me calling me a moron like that's how low my self esteem was I had this manager who talked shit to me and he made me print out my bank account statement and give him every dollar I had in order to get out of the contract. And so after years of struggling as an actor in LA, suddenly I was at a zero financially. And then I got into a car accident. Someone hit, ran a stop sign and then I had to get surgery from that, but I still had to work because I had no money. I was a personal trainer at the time. I had migraines from hitting my head, all of this stuff. And a week to the day after my car, after that car accident, limping through the gym, migraines, having to work because I had no money. I walk out and my rental car had been hit and run on the side of the road and bumper hanging off complete. And my brain broke. It was just like, wah, 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 that movie moment where it just, I, I broke, I snapped. And out of pure desperation, I called the one spiritual friend I had. And I said, I need aura cleansing or some shit like you like, called and you're like do you have sage I, yeah <laughs> I was like i don't know what to do it feels like i'm walking mm. around and there's a, a a cloud over my head raining just on me i don't know what to do and i'm i'm desperate and out of sheer desperation i wound up he's like i know you need to talk to you, you need to talk to this intuitive you need to talk to this this person and i was like okay and i reach out to her and and she says, this is in October, I think. And she says, okay, I can, I can fit you in in January. And I said, no, I'm going to be dead by January. <laughs> I'm going to be dead. I, this is happening now. I'm car accidents, all these things. And she said, no, you don't understand. Now that we've created this connection, I'm going to be visited by your ancestors, your angels, all of these things. And I can't help you until they visit me in my dreams. And I went, 
Oh, God. <laughs> Fuck. Okay, whatever. I'm desperate. And so January rolls around. I make it to January. And we get on a call, and it's a two-and-a-half-hour call. And I remember nothing from that call except for this moment where she's talking just like I'm talking. And then suddenly she stops. She says, I don't know why, but they're telling me that you need to get into a Native American drum circle or sweat lodge as soon as possible. And then she just goes back to saying all the shit about my, my grandma and different things that I don't, do not remember. But the frequency of what she said to me and the difference of it stopped me in my tracks. And it was the one thing that I remembered when I got off the call. And now I could do that. I could get into a drum circle or a sweat lodge or whatever tomorrow. But at that time, I had no idea how the hell I'm going to do that. But I just heard about this thing called ayahuasca that my friend had done. And he had said it was in a circle with a shaman. So I said, called him up and said, can you... Four days later, I'm in an ayahuasca ceremony. And I sat Friday and Saturday night and went from being an atheist who was desperate to figure things out to more or less who I am today from a spiritual perspective of believing in the things that I believe about the interconnectivity, believing in the presence of spirit, God, whatever word we want to use for the divine, um, all essentially in one weekend. Wow. Mm. And how did that, okay, so from, from that first, you know, two-night experience with ayahuasca, how does, you know, how do psychedelics make their way into your life now? Did you continue to go back? You know, one of the interesting things that a lot of people um, ask me and just conversations around me around is like, you know, how often do these things make their way into your life? And, I think it's all about, you know, the intention in which you use any of these medicines. And I believe in, you know, one of my favorite books as of recently is called Drug Use for Grown-Ups by Carl Hart. It's an incredible book. Around, I love Carl Hart. Yeah. So, you know, if you're familiar with his work, but it's around responsible substance use as an adult and how it can be additive if you, you know, meet all of your citizen duties in society. That's not like a, yeah. a ma you know, a masterful executive summary, but that's kind of one of the essences of the book. Um, some people do ayahuasca once. And they're like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And they have, you know, an incredible experience and, you know, or sometimes not, but they get what they need from it and they never do it again. Some people, you know, so they say go to ayahuasca church every weekend and there's a, you know, kind of a danger in that as well. How do, what do, you know, plant medicines look like in your life? Um, it's, they're seasons. They're very intentional in my life. And so... I've probably sat 50 some odd ayahuasca ceremonies at this stage since 2013, January 2013 was my first one. So, I mean, we're approaching 10 years. Um, so based on that, that's an average of five to six a year. And so I've gone a year and a half without sitting. And then I go down to the jungle and do a dieta and I sit eight times in three weeks, you know? Um, and so when they show up and how they show up is... Um, sort of out of, I'm not seeking anymore. So that's how it shifted for me. At the time of my spiritual awakening, one of the things that I would do is I would take one or two tabs of LSD and I would blindfold myself and I would put on uh, either a playlist or binaural beats and I would have a journal and I would just go blindfolded into meditation for hours. And, and I would come out and I would just like make a few notes and then I would go back in. And then I would do that and I would just explore my consciousness through the use of LSD blindfolded for, it was probably weekly. I mean, 10 hours of meditation on LSD, like every week and, and taking notes. And then the next day I would go in and I would flesh out the notes. So there's an understanding. And, um, I have that whole thing written out, you know, it's, it's there. And that was a part of my awakening. And then ayahuasca has transformed my life in so many ways from literally revealing my like being the cause of my spiritual awakening to revealing the repressed memory of sexual abuse to telling me that I would have a million dollar client in by the end of the week and that coming true um all of those and this is from bank account zero or was this no no this stage? is late this was a, at a later stage but I was told that um I I I eventually signed a one year coaching agreement where I was paid a million dollars and um, to coach someone for a year. 
And that was told to me in ayahuasca and said, this will happen by the end of the week. And I was shown three people and there's like, it's one of these three people. And it ended up happening. And from the date of that ceremony, five days later, I was transferred a million dollars upfront, one lump sum. And so like ayahuasca and I, she, she has been one of the greatest teachers that I've ever had. She is, um, benevolent. She's, she has shown me so much and taught me so much, but I don't go to her now necessarily seeking anymore. And that's a big shift. I don't go into these medicines seeking anymore. Um, I use them intentionally in different ways, depending on what's needed. And, um, it's more like I feel called to them at certain points. I, I feel the calling is like, ah, it's about that time. I can feel that it, and I said, it's gonna show up. There will be a ceremony that shows up because I can feel the threads of it. And I think that that's one of the things that as we become more, I don't even say spiritual, but as we become more energetically attuned, right? We This is all energy, this is all frequency. And so the threads of, of our future are all around us. You seen Donnie Darko? No. You haven't seen Donnie Darko? No. Oh my God, please watch Donnie Darko. Okay. Please watch Donnie Darko. I That's think my takeaway from this. I think you would love Donnie Darko. It's this old okay. movie. Anyway, there's this, they, these things that come out of them and, and show you where they're going to lead. It's like this path that they're following and this idea of predestination versus free will. Mm. And anyway, my point is that we're living within the, the dimension of linear time, but Time is not, like not all dimensions are within linear time. There's beyond that, which is why we can experience things like past lives and, and various other aspects beyond time or premonitions or, or, or these different things. And I feel like the threads of energy are something that you start to attune yourself to and have the ability to feel into and become more sensitive to to the point where you know when something's going to happen in your life. You don't know how it's going to show up or where it's going to show up, but you can start to feel that like approaching thing. That's how I feel like when I feel my food coming at a restaurant, I can feel it behind me. You know, like when the waiter's <laughs> coming, I'm like, I know. You just know. I just know. Your system already knows. It's yeah. just a tune. I wish it was real. applied to like more relevant things. I mean, we're a little more exciting, but maybe that's the... <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, this good might point. be more relevant than any anything right, I just else. Need to shift my perspective. <laughs> totally, you just this got the greatest superpower great. ever. You get to use this every day. Million dollar oh. clients. I like yeah. that's once in a no, lifetime. My maybe salad I don't know. Is behind me, and it's about to land on my table. Anyways, continue. Yeah, I I I don't even know what I was saying. Really? No, I I think um I I loved everything you just said, and I. You know what we were talking before we started recording the podcast around, um, you know, your your daily use of of microdosing and mm -hmm. and things like that. And I also love you to share a little bit about about that as well. Like a, I'm very passionate about microdosing. I, I speak about it a lot. We have mm -hmm. a nonprofit specifically focused on microdosing, um, and so I'm a huge believer and also you know macro heroic dosing and things mm -hmm. like that but a lot of what my work is focused on is like this slight neuroplasticity whether it's achieved through you know sub perceptual psilocybin or lsd you know which and for people that are not familiar with what microdosing is and i'm, I'm also trying to do a better job of like explaining what that is mm -hmm. and assuming that not everyone knows um but it's when you take a small amount of psilocybin or another psychedelic in your daily life. So usually it's like 0.1 to 0.2 grams of psilocybin, um, you know, like a tenth of a full tab of, of LSD-ish. And would love to hear you share how you use that in your life and just different things that you've noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's important for people to understand that the actual neuroplastic benefits of these chemicals don't require the psychedelic effect. So to open up the, one of the biggest things, I remember this study and it was with LSD where they put people into like a fMRI CAT scan machine uh, and they showed them these images while they were in the machine and they were just reading their, their brain uh, activity while they were see, being shown these images of like a gorilla and then a, a banana and then a tropical island or whatever. And then they gave them LSD and then they put them in and they did the same thing. And when viewing the same images, different parts of the brain would activate and have activity that wasn't there in the control. 
And what it shows you is that your brain is putting together different patterns on the same circumstances, which is why it's, it's so effective for looking at your wounds, your trauma, your past or whatever is because it's the same circumstance you've been viewing over and over and over again, but you have an actual neurochemical reaction that is different going on in your brain that's gonna allow you to put together different patterns, which full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when people think about the benefits of psychedelics, they also associate it with tripping out and like visual stuff and like being loopy and not able to do stuff. but they've proven that the the benefits of neuroplasticity and those that pattern recognition and activating different parts of the brain happens with subperceptual uh doses of mm -hmm. psychedelics so you don't actually need to even feel it for it to be having that benefit and mm -hmm. so depending on my day and what i'm doing like today I microdosed because I'm coming in, I'm, I have this podcast and then I'm going on the Know Thyself podcast and I want to open myself up. And that was the intention I set. I said, I want to open myself up to be a vessel for the highest level of, of information that I have available to me right now to come through in these moments. And and that's that was the intention that I set and that's why I microdosed. If I'm going to do a a day of of zoom meetings i probably am not gonna probably not gonna microdose if i'm gonna get into uh, designing my business infrastructure and ecosystem i'll probably microdose like it, it's understanding when and where and, and how and people are doing this all the time by the way they're doing it with nicotine because they're smoking or they're vape pens they're doing it with caffeine on a regular basis they're doing it with sugar and refined sugar like these all have impact on our neurochemistry and um people are are utilizing that medicinally whether they're aware of it or not they're like oh i'm so tired i need a coffee great you're doing the same thing and i and i want to continue to see psychedelics be in that conversation of oh i'm so tired and i have this day let me take a microdose of lsd instead of the caffeine which can you know very well make the body super acidic and there's a lot of other things and people usually are getting it like the frappes and the syrups and all the things so um yeah i'm a big proponent of microdosing and and psychedelics as a whole yeah i know that you know very much believe that they should be a part of the wellness conversation <laughs> totally. and um for anyone that's interested in microdosing you definitely go check out microdosing collective there's a lot of podcasts we record i always ask everyone you know do you microdose and, and how if so does it make your way into your life and it's really interesting because a lot of people have kind of come out of the psychedelic closet about their microdosing specifically mm -hmm. on the podcast because it is very common but a lot of people don't know about it and we were just you know just a brief tangent on this if you're curious yeah um is we were just doing college tours this week for super mesh um, which is our which is our brand and we were going around and, and sharing with college kids and so interesting because you know i'm also a huge believer in functional mushrooms, which, you know, to my understanding, you also use in your in your daily life. We can chat about that as well. But um, so interesting how many people had no awareness around functional mushrooms. But, you know, we kind of described super mush as like the legal version of microdosing because lion's mane and mm -hmm. different mushrooms do the same thing to your brain. You know, lion's mane increases neuroplasticity in the brain. And it creates, you know, it, it helps your memory. It's like the brain mushroom. So a lot of times when people are microdosing, they're actually feeling the lion's mane a lot of these stocks with psilocybin will also have lion's mane, cordyceps, bacopa, you know, a bunch of other adaptogens and superfoods as well. And when we explained it as the legal version of microdosing, it resonated with people because microdosing is so front and center of so many people's brains right now because mental health and creativity and all the flow state and all these things that people want um, are just, they're just exploding across you know, especially due to COVID and everything that's happening in the world right now. So um, anyway, just kind of like an interesting side note on that. I'd mm -hmm. also like you to share, you know, I always ask people about their use of functional mushrooms. Like, how, you know, how do functional mushrooms make their way into your life? Like what kind of other like supplements and like wellnessy things do you do? Oh, so many. Resume. I know <laughs> so you have a many. full wellness routine. Yeah, yeah, totally. You don't need to dive full <laughs> into it, specifically on the mushroom front. Yeah, I, I am a fan of incorporating mushrooms into like i use symbiotica products mm -hmm. i'm a big fan yeah. shervin's a friend of mine and um they have like a longevity mushroom thing i think i brought some for you um over to jason goldberg's house 
Um, Shout out Jason Goldberg. We yeah. love him. And then they have like a protein powder that also has mu the, a mushroom blend in it. And I find that um, just incorporating them into my life is a good thing. I, I just, um, I use them similar to coffee. Uh, another thing I use everyday dose, the, mm -hmm. the like a third of it's coffee and then like two thirds like these mushroom blends. And mm -hmm. and I I love it. I feel great on it. It's a part of, of my supplementation and um yeah i love your guys's product too are you guys i don't have any of it anymore well i will send you home with it so that will be fixed <laughs> Fantastic. yeah and i one thing that you did touch on that i feel is really important is the mental health aspect because mm. we're i've spoken a lot about how it can open up in that way but as someone who struggled with depression for most of my life um and really got out of that i do think that psychedelics psychedelic assisted therapies uh, micro dosing and all of it has massive potential to help people and I know that when I was in my darkest places I felt so hopeless and there are a lot of people out there that I know feel that way and I believe that psychedelics offer an opportunity to rewrite that story for so many people and and from micro dosing which now has evidence for how that can support with mental health to um you know even people who are struggling really badly with addiction and what's possible with ibogaine and, and different and mdma assisted therapies so uh, i'm excited for where this is headed yeah and in, in total agreement um and thank you for sharing all that i think it's so important to normalize psychedelics as part of the conversation for people that are doing big things in the world and so i always encourage you know I've talked to many founder CEOs that are like, mm, like, how do I come out of the psychedelic closet and share that, you know, microdosing LSD or psilocybin has been massive for my creativity at work. And like all the money I've raised is because, you know, I felt inspired or like because of various ceremonies that I've done, like, and I think it's so important to normalize. And it's especially important with people that have big platforms and are public figures out in the world that people look up to mm -hmm. and you want to emulate habits like Tim Ferriss and, and the, a lot of you know, big self-help people, I wouldn't necessarily call them self-help, but, you know, leaders in, in business and startup world and, and life hacks mm -hmm. that I followed for so long, when they started to speak about their use of psychedelics, I was like, oh, this is interesting because I resonate with so much else of what you do. And now you're starting to share about your experience with psychedelics, which was not on my radar until like, mm. you know, seven, eight years ago. And so anyway, I think for high performing people that are at the top of their game, I think it's like the most important for them to be speaking about how they use it both for mental health and for human optimization. So I appreciate you doing so. Oh, you're very welcome. Happy to do so. Um, last, like, you know, I, I have 25 questions. I probably got to like seven of them, but a few <laughs> things I did want to touch on before we kind of wrap things up, you know, you have this, um, epic poem that's pinned to the top of one of your Instagram posts and I believe it's called treat yourself like someone you love that maybe that, that this, you are who you've been looking for you are who you've been looking for okay mm -hmm. um one of the lines in it is treating is about treating yourself mm -hmm. like someone you love and I watched it this morning and you know you and I have been chatting about our post integration from Burning Man which is like we don't have time to die it's a whole other animal so we'll dive into that on another episode <laughs> um or maybe we'll chat about that when I come on yours or whatever mm -hmm. but uh you know I it's just been a, a lot of chaos the last few weeks. And so I watched that poem this morning in preparation for this interview and it calmed my nervous system down. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this is so beautiful. Kind of simple if you really think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just exploded on the internet. Yeah. It's, it's gotten whatever, how many million of views? 200 you, million. You know, just casual, casual 200 million views on the internet. And I'd love you to share like how you treat yourself like someone you love. Mm. For anyone listening a, that may be that may be looking for that right now. That is a great question. How do I treat myself like someone I love? Erwan. <laughs> Erwan, Olipops, matcha mint chip smoothies. Matcha mint chips. Um, I think that this is what I'll say about this. Because knowing my routines and stuff, sure, absolutely. And people get really hung up on the self-love thing because I feel there's a fundamental misunderstanding of how it works. There's this idea that I either love myself or I don't. 
And I don't believe that's how it works. I actually see self-love as the byproduct of the relationship you have with yourself. And so similarly, um, you and I have never had a one-on-one -on -one sit down conversation. We've never gone to it's lunch or anything. Like, it's, it's right. So we still have never had a one-on-one. -on -one. We have someone here <laughs> Matrix watching is here. Matrix here. So like we've <laughs> never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So really the, the depth of our relationship is going to be limited by the experiences that we've shared together hmm. and the energy that we put into that relationship. Right. So if I want to develop love for someone, it's even go as simply as the five love languages, right? Like quality time, physical touch, words of affirmation, just using those, those as a framework. If I want to develop a deeper friendship, romantic partnership, business partnership, whatever, I get to look at how much of those things am I bringing into this relationship? How often, how consistently, to what depth? And the people that I do that more with, I'm going to have deeper love for. I'm going to have, there's going to be more of a bond there. And so when we think about loving ourselves and treating ourselves as someone we love, so few people think about it through the lens of what is the relationship that I'm developing with myself? What are, what, how do I bring words of affirmation into my life? For most of my life, I had tons of negative self-talk. It was primarily negative. I thought it was important to be negative so that I could drive myself and motivate myself. You're like, you little piece of shit, lift that weight at the gym. And that sort of coming from an athletic background where a lot of times coaches were like that too. And so I had to change the way I spoke to myself because if you just, all you did was tell me I was worthless and, and too skinny and all these things, like I, I wouldn't really want to hang out with you either. And then those sorts of, that sort of perception of what is the relationship I'm developing with myself? If we can start to see self-love through that lens, instead of this idea that it's either a light switch on or off, like I either have it or I don't, uh, we start to rewrite the narrative about it. And I think that people can recognize that it, it gets to be a process of learning to love yourself. And the things that I do now to love myself, I didn't even know were things that I liked before, you know, like taking baths. I love to take baths. <laughs> I absolutely love to take baths. I have this epic bathtub at my house. And I just, I took one this morning. I told you I couldn't sleep. I this I had so much on my mind. I couldn't sleep, and I don't fight that anymore. I don't toss and turn in bed for very long. So I was up at five thirty a.m. and what did I do? I got in the bath. Got in the bath. Epsom salts, and I got in the bath. I love baths. Baths helped me through depression. They were a massive part of my life, and so I didn't even know I liked that. In fact, I would have thought that's a very feminine thing to do. So I would have avoided it at a certain point when I felt more insecure about myself. And so learning that I even love baths is like learning something cool about someone you're dating. Mm -hmm. You learn that over time. You learn that through putting in the time. You learn that through being in observation of, of my feelings and, and my own feelings. And so it's like dating yourself. I have a course on my website called Five Days of Dating Yourself, where it's literally I just five days. Can you date yourself to get to know yourself as a foundational element of how you start to love yourself? And so um, that's my, that's, really, I think the more important thing when we say treat yourself like someone you love is to spend the time developing the relationship with yourself, a loving relationship. I actually notice that hit home a lot. So thank you for sharing that. Um, when I start to notice that my energy is not stable when I'm by myself, I'll notice that's when I'm off. Like when mm -hmm. I don't, because I really like hanging out with myself. Mm -hmm. I'm always talking to myself in my head. I tell Jason all the time, who's one of a mutual best friend of ours, that I can tell when I'm good because I'm constantly just like making myself laugh and like telling myself jokes all day in my head. And that's when I know when I'm in a good spot. But if I'm alone and I'm not like, comfortable and I'm like oh like I need to call someone or I need to I need to and that's sometimes fine right because you can um it's I feel very healthy to like go outside of yourself and get help from other people when you need it but 
when I'm in a good spot, it's when I'm really investing the time to like be with myself and, mm -hmm. and date myself. And The Artist Way is an incredible book that taught me all those things. I used to take myself on dates every Friday. Mm -hmm. I've kind of lost steam on it. So this is reigniting. Well, you got a interest. lot of dudes taking you on dates now. So <laughs> there's going to be, there's going to be just less, less opportunity. You're for like, self dates. Yourself will have to get in line. <laughs> I have to make more reservations for myself. Got it. Absolutely. Um, Maybe like, lunch dates for yourself. Lunch dates save, for myself. save lunch for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And yeah, no, that was a huge teacher for me, that book mm -hmm. and prioritizing stepping into my creative energy, being with myself and doing things, you know, and I think that's the, that was the ultimate teacher for me and what that really meant because I wasn't really sure what self-love meant before that, that mm -hmm. book and everything you just said resonated. So yeah. And, and everyone so, go so watch what does that. that look like now? So if you're actually out you're at home and you're realizing, wow, I'm just uncomfortable in my skin right now. I d I'm looking for some way to distract myself. What would you do? What do you do? I mean, first thing is usually if I'm like, if there's like residue stress, I make a list because usually it's just, and this isn't the date like sexy part, obviously. This is not like what I do on my artist dates, but I just need to get things out of my head and like onto a thing. And mm -hmm. then, you know, there's a general like wellness stack of like, I sit down, I do my, I meditate, I sit in front of a red light, I sit at my altar. I've built an altar. I'm an altar person now after this year and I love it. Mm -hmm. And um, I usually veer towards like, putting something inspirational into my brain, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's like reading or writing, like it's, it's just often like having a conversation with myself that I wasn't giving myself the space to have mm -hmm. my, one of my favorite books. I love that is I love how we're shifting. Now you're the interviewer. Um, I have, I like, you're going to come yeah, on the deep dive podcast with me and, and I'll, we'll have we'll, a whole other we'll deep, dynamic. We'll deep dive. Um, one of my favorite books is meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And he was like the greatest Roman emperor the greatest guy of his time, arguably, this is like pre-social media. So he had no, you know, Instagram. <laughs> pre-social media, yes. Right. Pretty pre-social media. It was just on the edge, right? It was, Instagram it was came right out. before. Instagram he came just out. missed Twitter, I think. <laughs> Instagram barely. launched a few days after he died. And yeah. so he, he, you know, escaped the wrath. Yeah. But nothing really, you know, to compare himself to. But the whole book is his internal dialogue like fear wisdom you know him speaking to himself out of fear and then responding to himself out of wisdom and that's kind of how my journal entries look where it's like you're giving yourself the space to have a conversation with yourself and actually like talk yourself through the things that are happening mm -hmm. you know and so um anyway it's 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 kind of a roundabout answer i, well, but I love what you said of, of you realize that it just simply means you haven't created the space to have the conversation with yeah. yourself that, like, that what's you need going to on have. Here? I love that. Yeah. I really, I think that's great. And journaling is huge for me. Yeah. Journaling is huge for me because it's a chance for me to talk to myself yeah. and that have that conversation and that dialogue. And it's funny that you said that because I have a poem uh, that I don't have memorized, but I remember like the first line was, um, would Jesus have been Jesus if Twitter was around back then? <laughs> and what do you think? It's like, like if in 33 BC, would Jesus have had an Instagram? And and like that was that was that the was like the starting the lines of this we poem. Sleep over. <laughs> that was the starting of a poem of of just this this recognition um, that social media has changed so much, you know. And I have a love hate relationship with it. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. I I um, struggle sometimes with the idea, and you know, so you don't know this about me, but. 99% of my revenue, 90% of my revenue since 2013 has been high-end one-on-one coaching. That's still to this day how I would say I earn most of my revenue. And yet, if you were to look at my Instagram and, and different stuff, you wouldn't necessarily know that that's what I'm doing necessarily. And then you also wouldn't know that I'm an artist. It's like a blend of all these things. And I realized that part of the issue was that I had a deep resistance to social media and being seen as a coach. I really, everyone with an Instagram page is a coach. And I, you know, most people are just regurgitating stuff that they've heard on different places and, and they're great marketers, they're charismatic, they're attractive. And a lot of this goddess circle things, they're half naked and, and like there's all of this <laughs> thing that's happening. No judgment, um, the little judgment, a little judgment. <laughs> I have a year too much. I have a, two podcasts actually. One's called "Year Too Much," and I go into this um, deep. But <laughs> sidetracked. My point is that I think that social media 
we were here for the inception of you're younger than me i i am the generation where i grew up without the internet and i grew up without cell phones and i grew up having to print out when MapQuest first came out print out the the things and like oh wow and yeah and so then it's when i when i was in high school we weren't allowed to use the internet as a source for our reports we had to go to the library and check out books they wouldn't accept internet sources and so then by the time i got to college people had laptops and it was like it had been in, in embraced in a whole new way that it's almost silly to think of anyone going to the library <laughs> and by the time you read that book it's outdated compared to what's on the internet and so I'm in this really unique generation that I feel is really important of a generation that remembers what it was like before and was early enough adopters to really embrace the technology in a, in a new way because like it outpaced my parents, right? And so it's a really interesting stage to be in. And I'm, I think that social media is so new, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. that there's an entire society that doesn't know how to healthily be with social media. We've gone just deep into it and that's gonna lead to a lot of like, we have cyberbullying. That wasn't a thing when I was growing up. We have all of these things that we have to figure out as a society how to be with. And that includes starting on a personal level of how do we relate to our social media? I noticed that your social media, I, you don't, like a lot of your stories are what's going on with Supermush and uh some aspects of like what you're doing out there but you don't necessarily are talking into the camera mm -hmm. in in that sort of way and i appreciate the fuck out of that i love that because i often do that i got hit by a car yesterday on my e-bike and the first thing i did while i was waiting for the dude to go and get an allen wrench so i could fix my bike was all right guys i just got hit by a car here i am this is a moment of gratitude and i just shared my experience mm -hmm. And it's funny because that's why people follow me. They love that I'm I'm sharing my experience. But at the same time, I think it's fucking crazy that I just got hit by a car and the first thing I'm doing is taking my phone out and making an Instagram story about it. Mm. And so it's this just tricky thing that I don't know how I got on this tangent, but make, consider it the microdose. It's, <laughs> it just hit. It just hit. Uh, when yeah. your microdose hits. I mean, good, <laughs> good thing Marcus Aurelius just missed it, you know? Just that's right jesus and marcus aurelius had jesus. it so much simpler yeah no I, I i love that and i think that's that's stuff for me to noodle on i think the takeaway from that to close that comment out and then we'll close things out we'll circle we'll circle back and um I have a few yeah, final sorry, questions that was a whole for you. soapbox that I just no, we, no i loved it it was amazing <laughs> but if you were to take the time that you do not spend on or that you currently spend on social media and take that time towards dating yourself and having those conversations with yourself i think it would be a, you know you'd have a different relationship i'd be a better so, person just in general people are like are you, are you <laughs> talking in, gen in general in general general like i'm looking at my let's say i didn't use instagram and i took those hours to actually you know we're all so busy so i didn't use instagram even though it's relevant for our work and all that if we took those hours and we're just like in that conversation with ourselves mm -hmm. like it would you know you'd probably have a different relationship with yourself you'd be dating yourself more you well know? how do you do how do you do that is the interesting thing yeah. right like for for me as an example for my first video that i ever put out on the internet like teaching anything was in 2013 almost 10 years of me talking into a camera saying this is what i'm learning about spirituality back before facebook live when you had to upload it and and literally <laughs> 2013 when the only people that saw it were like my high school friends like what the fuck adam's lost his mind <laughs> and so i've been putting out content for free on the internet for 10 years it's amazing and the idea it's become so ingrained into what i do and how i relate to the world that the idea of not doing that anymore seems almost crazy to not mm -hmm. do it anymore and so it's just a very fascinating back and forth because mm -hmm. i agree i think there's a, that all of that time put towards something else would be powerful and all of think of the you know thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of lives that you've touched because you do so mm. so it's it's just finding the balance you know it's balance it's all it all, all depends and uh, conclusion it all depends yeah I've and we're all here to transcend the human experience we're anyway, all here to why transcend why are we even talking about any of this um it's just kumbaya <laughs> I have a few final questions for you. Yeah. There's many more things that we could go into. This has been we a did, good conversation. We, could, we covered a lot. For a three-on-one conversation. For, 
oh, we, for four of us here. We covered a lot of ground. Um, <laughs> what are you most excited about right now? What's next for you in the next six months? If you had to kind of like synthesize summer into like a you know sixty second thing, um, what can people expect from you next in your talking head and Instagram? The art of breaking up. It's my new uh, course, my new online course that I'm releasing. It's called The Art of Breaking Up, 10 Keys for Turning Your Breakup into Beauty. Breakups have been the biggest curriculum in my life, basically. And uh, I made a whole reality show about a breakup. That's how much it impacted my, my life. And I finally have synthesized it down into the things that worked for me over the series of several breakups and learning how to traverse it. Because where people get screwed up is thinking that, okay, I'm no longer in relationship, so now I'm single. And they start comparing how they feel to how they want to feel when they're single. But when you exit a relationship, you don't become single. You exit a relationship and you enter into the breakup process. And then you become single. And if you don't understand how to navigate the breakup process, you can get lost in it like I did for years. And so um, it's finally time for me to put that all into one place to really help people. And this is not just people who are breaking up romantically. If you've lost friendships, if you've had a loved one die, if you're just struggling to move on, mm. um, this this is things that I know work because they worked for me. Mm. Beautifully said. You don't just go from summer to fall. There's It slowly, slowly gets colder. Yeah, that's I, I love that. What's it called? Is it called the? It's breakup? called the art of breaking up. The art of breaking and, up. And um, and then the only other thing that I want to mention is I'm finally going back on the road again and doing live live. Wow. You've seen me perform live and kind of do kind of do a little bit of. You've gotten to see what I do when I'm live, but they've never been my show like my events. So I'm going back on the road and doing live events in November. Um, I'm very excited. I'm gonna wow. do I'm gonna do like Austin and New York and Miami. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, wonderful. Um, the last question for you is, what is the single most important lesson that mushrooms or psychedelics have taught you? I would say that I don't know anything. I would say that there's been enough times that I've entered into, into ceremonies thinking I had things figured out or had an idea of what this life is or who I am and have been completely flipped upside down. And so psychedelics have taught me to stop trying so hard to figure it out or to know any of it and really focus on just enjoying the journey. Like I said in the beginning of that poem, the most impactful thing you can do for the world is learn how to love life. And I really believe that. I don't want to take lessons from anyone who hates life. If you haven't figured out how to love this experience, then, you know, go do that before you tell me how to live mine. Mm. Mm. I love it. Where can people find you? I got a lot of online real estate. So check out adamroa.com, A-D-A-M-R-O-A.com. There will be a refreshed... Uh, intro what do i do <laughs> let now me that, add that to the list of things more we, in the human experience 100%. even though i think it was beautifully written but thank you anyways adamrow.com adamrow.com um is a hub uh i'm on all the socials you know youtube facebook instagram adam.row on instagram twitter and then um yeah i have two podcasts i have the deep dive with adam row which you you should come on we should really continue continue this where every time i have a guest so the way this works is we actually have a question that we explore together I love so that. we come up with like a really sometimes triggering or questions that don't really have answers and we just explore it together on the podcast. So that's what the deep dive is. And then I have a podcast called You're Too Much that I co-host with Taylor Simpson, which is we have episodes like I've had fingers up my ass since 2015 or I want to see my husband fuck another woman. Like those are the topics we go into 22 minutes, super fire. Um, so yeah, those are those are the main places that you, you can find me and, and follow and um, get a little bit of, of this in your life if it so intrigues you. Amazing. Well, I'm so glad you came on. I'm yeah. so glad that Saren was here to join us. Um, everyone, definitely go check out all of Adam's content. His Instagram is awesome. Like a few of the poems that I watched this morning just – change the course of, of my day. And so I think that is the most impactful thing that you're you're doing for people. You will never know the full effects of it because um, you can. it's impossible to do so, but it's really making a massive impact on people. So thank you and more to come. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. 
Thanks for diving into the multiverse with us. If you're interested in being a featured guest on the show, sponsorship, partnership, or you're just mushroom curious, we're always looking to expand our mycelium network. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Into the Multiverse, where you can find clips from this podcast, psychedelic legalization news, events that we're doing, and so much more. In addition, we've also created the world's first ever mushroom-specific marketplace called The Multiverse, which you can find on Instagram at Multiverse or online at yourmultiverse.com. We've also created our own in-house consumer lifestyle brand called Supermush. We make mushroom mouth sprays. We make a whole line of mushroom streetwear. You can find it on Instagram at Supermush or online at supermush.com. We'll see you next week. Mush love.